Welcome to the AACFB's 2022 Meet the Funder webinar series. My name is Monica Harper, and I'm the Executive Director of the AACFB, and I'll be your host. Founders First Capital Partners is both a funding source member and a bronze sponsor of the AACFB. Before I turn it over to Casey and Bella, I'd like to go over a few items to make this webinar more enjoyable and informative for everyone. During the presentation, you should see a Q&A box that allows you to ask questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit your questions in the box and they should be answered by the end of the webinar. The entire webinar should take no more than 30 to 45 minutes. For those of you who'd like to review this webinar at a later date, it will be posted on the 2022 Meet the Funder page of the website and will be emailed to the AACFB membership. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Tracy who will introduce Casey and Bella. It is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for joining us today with the AACFB and Founders First Capital Partners co-hosted webinar around the power of partnering with a revenue-based funder. Um, we will be covering the growing need for growth capital for diverse-led businesses, the new fundraising conundrum, and answering the question of what is revenue-based financing and how does it work? We'll also dive into a case study and finish up with some information about partnering us with any deals that you may have. Uh, before we begin, let me introduce today's presenters. We have Casey and Bella from the Founders First Capital Partners Investment Team. Um, Bella is a senior investment director that's passionate about working with diverse founders to scale and grow their businesses. Leading the investment team at Founders First Capital Partners, she specializes in supporting businesses' growth by utilizing a broad set of impactful strategic and capital resources. Formerly a director at Lighter Capital, she believes that increased access to innovative capital sources is a crucial part of this mission. She holds degrees in political science and a secondary background in the nonprofit sector, which gives her a unique and holistic perspective on economic empowerment and equity within the capital markets. On the other side, we have Casey Estrada, who has focused his career on growing early stage businesses. While he still functions as an advisor at Tip House, Casey currently serves as the Director of Investments for Founders First Capital Partners, which aims to support diverse-led businesses through advisory services and direct access to capital with revenue-based financing and term loans. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thanks, Tracy, and really excited to be here talking to all of you. Um, so I won't bore you with any more of a background. That was a great overview, but long story short, Casey and I make up the investment team for Founders First, where we um, work together to really be the relationship managers, the, the leaders of all the deals, um, you know, looking at partnering with other institutions to drive more, more business, get more capital deployed to the market that we're trying to serve, um, both of us having a background in specialty finance investments and specifically um, revenue-based financing. Great, thanks, Bella, and uh, excited to be uh, here speaking with everybody. Um, I may have met some of you down at the conference uh, about a month ago, so so great to be speaking with everybody again here. Um, but Founders First, just uh, as a as an overview, so we're a mission driven organization that aims to add high quality jobs into the marketplace by supporting businesses that struggle uh, due to racial and socioeconomic gaps within the small business community. Uh, we focus on helping businesses that are run by women, minorities, uh, veterans, uh, LGBTQ founders, as well as those located in or even servicing low to moderate income areas. And we accomplish this by providing education and mentorship via our accelerator programs, and also by offering direct access to capital through two specific products, which we'll go into more detail today, uh, revenue-based financing and term loans. Uh, our market is diverse-led companies with annual revenues between $500,000 to $10 million in the B2B space. Uh, we are industry agnostic, but our funding programs are geared towards businesses that have predictable, recurring, or contracted revenue streams. And uh, just as a snapshot of, of the work that we've done to date, uh, Founders First has supported over 600 small businesses. Uh, and of those, over 60% of increased revenues and profits uh, have added recurring revenue and hired for quality jobs. And over half have gone on to also raise outside capital. Now, one thing I do want to note, you know, while we do help businesses through accelerator programs and coaching, uh, we don't require that businesses go through those programs to be able to fund. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks, Casey. And so speaking specifically to the funding side, so we basically have two sides of the business. Casey just mentioned the you know program side and how that interacts with the funding side. We basically have companies that will only ever come to us to go through programs, executive master classes, if you will. We have companies that will only ever come to us for funding. And then we have certainly have companies that have spanned both sides of the business, accessing both of our strategic and capital resources. So shifting gears specifically to the funding side, we really have a pretty unique and innovative model. So companies have a number of different ways when they're trying to grow um, to secure capital. There's there's so many different options out there these days, but the two most common ones that people talk about and hear about um, are really going to be banks on one side and then equity-based institutional venture capital, that kind of money on the other side. And so with us, um, an alternative lender and other alternative lenders in the space, revenue-based financing, um, that sort of thing, we're really in this middle ground. Whereas compared to banks, we're going to be most, we're gonna be most similar to banks, but as compared to that, we're gonna be much more flexible and much less restrictive in the way that we lend. So we're not going to care about the value of your house or your car or your personal credit score or anything like that to secure the loan. Um, and we're also not typically going to have any restrictive bank style covenants in, in our loans. And then compared to the other side of that spectrum, we're fully non-dilutive. We're not asking for any sort of ownership or um, equity stake in the business. So this is really just a, you know, better visual representation of kind of where, where we fit in there. So, you know, we really, we are taking a little bit of a higher risk because we're not collateralizing any personal assets to, in order to lend. We're not looking at any sort of your, you know, personal balance sheet, your house, anything like that. We're 99.9% .9 going to be basing our assumptions, our structuring, sizing, pricing off of the historical financials of the business. Because we're also not taking any sort of equity upside, we really need that history of the business, the numbers and the financials to kind of illuminate whatever path forward there might be. Um, and so that goes back to Casey's, um, you know, point on predominantly looking at B2B, highly predictable contract and subscription based businesses, because we can almost use that predictability of revenue, that stickiness in the model, if you will, to almost secure um, the amount of money that we are comfortable lending. So, um, you know, quickly going through these points here, as mentioned, you know, there's it's non-dilutive, doesn't base um, itself off of credit scores or personal collateral, and then we typically don't have have covenants. Um, and then, really, the best way to explain it in a simplified sense that Casey will get more into in a couple slides here is it's most similar to bank lending. So, in the way that you know, some amount is advanced upfront and repaid in a certain predefined structure over a fixed term. And these are really just, you know, talking through some of the other, other additions to the, the positives here. The biggest thing to note is that as a revenue-based financer, the overall theme is just alignment of interest. So not only are we, you know, lending based on the company's historical performance and growth and trajectory and, and all of that, um, so already we're we're basing what we can do off of what the company is doing, and we can scale with you over time as you grow. So again, very much a dynamic growth partnership there. Um, but we also are, you know, looking at the revenue and performance of the business to assess um, the payments and the repayment of the facility, future follow-ons, all of that. So it's it's very much tailored to. Let's take it as you need it. Let's not deploy a huge amount of capital up front just to make interest that you're paying interest on on a monthly basis and maybe not using right away. Um, but let's try to make this as advantageous and you know growth oriented as possible, meaning that we can scale with you over time. Um, and obviously, we're always going to you know try to increase our toolbox, meaning be able to offer those additional strategic resources alongside our funding, whether or not a company went through our programs, we always want to be able to, you know, give them a sounding board, additional resources to help them use the capital effectively, to help give them the tools to grow new revenue streams, make key hires, whatever that may be. Um, we really overall just have a holistic and partnership-minded approach to um, making these investments. And I'll let Casey get more into the specifics here around, um, you know, what we're looking for and, and how they could be structured. Yeah. So again, uh, non-bank lender, um, and we're offering revenue-based financing uh, and even just uh, just straight term loans, uh, as well as advisory support services um, 
think of it almost like business uh, consulting services for for some of our borrowers. Uh, again, not required, but but one of the benefits of working with Founders First. Um, so the types of business we're looking for um, are typically doing at least a million dollars uh, in annual revenue. Um, are, are checking one of the boxes when it comes to one of our uh, mission-driven diversity requirements. Um, we don't require profitability, so but if the business is is, is break even or can demonstrate a pathway to profitability, that's extremely helpful for us. Uh, we want to see growing revenues or, or positive trends within the business, um, and then and then probably most important is uh, the recurring or predictable nature of the business. Uh, again, a lot of times that could come in just as, as contracts or, or or something like that. Um, and then and then minimum we want to see 12 months of revenue history it helps us understand the trends or the seasonality of the business if there is any uh and and as far as structure goes uh we'll we'll do shorter term like a like a 12 month uh, we can go up to five years um the amount we can provide smallest check is going to be fifty thousand dollars we can go up to two million dollars over time um and that's for for both term loans and revenue based financing. The only difference there, of course, is the payback mechanism. Term loan will be a fixed dollar amount, fully amortizing over the term of the loan. Revenue based financing, you know, while we are modeling in some type of a uh, a maturity date, it is a little bit uh, in flux. So based off the performance of the business, if the business pays us off, or if the business grows faster than anticipated, they could pay us off sooner. Uh, if it if they don't quite meet the projections. Um, you know that that maturity date would be would be delayed. Uh, even so, there's no no payment, uh, no no balloon payment or any or penalty for for that. Um, and uh, specifically, we can dig into uh, what what this model would look like um, on a on a uh, revenue based uh, loan. So this one just illustrates. Again, we can go up to two million over time. Uh, we like to do multiple tranches. Um, uh, the idea being, you know, we don't want a, a borrower to just take money if the money is just going to sit in their bank account for them to pay interest on, or we like them to grow into these facilities. Uh, we're, we're usually sizing this uh, in a range of about 15 to 30% of annualized revenue. We look at that on a trailing 12 month basis. Um, and on the, on the revenue based funding. Uh, so as an example company here, uh, let's say they're doing a million dollars in annual revenue, um, uh, you know, very, very typically we can give a $200,000 loan and on a three-year repayback, we might look to, uh, for a return of a 1.3 X of our, of our principal. So, you know, $60,000 of interest on $200,000 over three years, uh, paid back as a fixed single digit percentage, uh, of their monthly revenue. And then on the terms, term loan side, you know, we're, we're, we're sizing these things the same. We're underwriting uh, through the same process. The only difference here is really the, the, the payment. Uh, and this, like I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, is fixed dollar amount. Uh, so, you know, very predictable on a month to month basis, fully amortizing over the term of the loan. Of course, this one does have an exact maturity date uh, and we are, we're targeting the exact same return. So uh, on $200,000 over three years, very typical, we would look for a 1.3x return. And then, uh, you know, so you're all aware, uh, of course, we love working with brokers and our referral partners. Uh, we do have a program in place. Um, and so what we need to get started uh, from your clients uh, is, is uh, the financial reporting. So, so we're looking for at least two years of financial statements uh, by month in Excel. Um, we do want to see the revenue by customer uh, over that same time period, a debt schedule if ap applicable, um, and then projections are, are helpful as well. Uh, so much of uh, our underwriting is determined by the predictive ability of the revenue. So we do like to take a forward look there too. Um, from an initial converse, uh, conversation, we can we can do something in about 30 days. Um, you know, but by the time we get uh, the full financial package, uh, two to two to three weeks is, is pretty typical. Um, and we can even uh, connect with your customers uh, QuickBooks if they have that available. Uh, and we can we can distribute um, the instructions to be able to do that, which makes the, uh, the document uh, gathering process a lot more streamlined. Thanks, Casey. 
And so now that you have heard a little bit about, you know, how we think about lending and how we structure it, we wanted to just highlight one of our, you know, biggest and best clients. So Valerie, um, who is the CEO of Onshore, she has been working with us for years and was one of our first um, really quality spokes spokespeople for our model. She originally came to us via joining the other side of the business that we mentioned, which is the accelerator programs, had a really, um, saw a lot of success going through that, really loved working with us. And then we were also able to have her, you know, graduate from that program and be able to invest uh, $250,000 in one of our original revenue-based financing facilities to help her be able to go execute on a lot of the tools and growth plans that she put together through that program. Um, and then a few months later, she actually came back and, you know, per the, the structure that we talked through, was able to qualify for even more money. Um, and because she had grown, her performance had either stayed the same or gotten better. Um, and she had a very clear new use of funds that she really, you know, could could leverage an additional $250,000 um, and, and added capital for. And so now we've deployed uh, $500,000 in total. Um, we were also able to structure a basically a co-lending agreement with another lending partner to match funds to get her, you know, all the money that she needed up front. So we have a lot of different levers we can pull in this kind of creative model. Um, and we're actually in the process of, you know, uh, looking at what a third investment from us would look like. So we can continue to do this reinvesting, scaling alongside model um, for as long as it takes up to that $2 million in total exposure. And this is just a little bit more detail around, you know, how she used it, how she's been a really good um, example of the success that can come from this. You know, she was able to add team members, acquire a separate part of her business to capitalize on even more clients, um, expand all of her sales and marketing efforts, and really just become a, a much more mature business by not having to get out over her skis by either taking more debt than she needed up front, um, or by partnering with somebody that was going to, you know, put some restrictions on the way she was able to operate or by giving up equity before she was ready. And so working with somebody like us enabled her to, you know, have a very uh, loose and very uh, low set of restrictions where she could just go take the money and go execute. Um, obviously didn't have to sell any of her equity in order to secure that. And then, you know, as mentioned, we can continue to look to reinvest as she continues to use that money, pay it down, grow, and ideally, you know, continues to, um, need some additional growth capital that we can come in and partner with her for. And this also just highlights some of the big pluses of working with us is we're always, again, going to be a very holistic partner. You know, we've nominated her for the Inc. 5000 in multiple years. Um, she speaks with us at a lot of different events. She refers companies to us. We refer clients to her. Um, it's very much a, you know, not a one-stop shop. We definitely don't view it as a tr transactional relationship. We view it as a, you know, whether it's the programs or the money, that's kind of the foot in the door with each other. And then let's figure out all the ways that we can, you know, help support each other in, in our growth. And then as Casey mentioned, the next step, you know, we obviously love working with brokers, love working with partners, love finding ways to add value to your clients and, and our clients. Um, we have a referral agreement program where we certainly, you know, will we'll pay finders fees and always look to kind of foster those relationships. So certainly either of us are open to entertaining any of those conversations um, and, you know, talking through the best ways to pass potential interested parties uh, back and forth and ideally just create more um, generational wealth and more jobs in the process. And this will be sent out afterwards, I believe. So you'll have our contact information. And I think that opens the floor for Q&A. Great. Um, first question, and just as a reminder for everybody, please type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get them answered for you. Um, for the requirements, do they have to be LLC or corp or do you have currently fund sole props? That's a really good question. We don't have any strict requirements around what the entity structure legally has to be. We have funded a sole prop in the past and we funded LLCs and we have funded C Corps. Overall, we just like to see that the business owners and leaders are dedicated and this isn't like a side hustle. We wanna see that this is the predominant use of their time and their resources and the, that if we're being dedicated to helping them grow, that they're dedicated as well. 
there's obviously some nuances around, you know, the the legal side of of negotiations, et cetera, when it comes to the type of of entity. But as far as hard regulations around what we will and won't fund, we've worked with um, pretty much every every type of structure. Right. Um, uh, Tracy Tippett, she's asking for the slides, so um, I will be sending you guys the email addresses for everybody if you want to send the slides out to everybody, or obviously this is being recorded, so it will be available on our YouTube channel as well. Yeah, um, we'll go ahead and send the slides. Okay, great. Uh, next question, have you provided your facilities to finance companies? Meaning, I'm assuming you mean like lended to a finance company? Is that how? I guess, I don't know that's worded. Have you provided? Um, we have actually, we have funded a wealth management company. So not specifically, like we haven't funded another lender and then had our capital be used to go lend or something like that. We have funded a specialty finance um, company that is, you know, wealth management. So they have contracts and agreements with their clients to continuously manage their money, that kind of thing. And we were funding the entity that was securing those clients. So our capital is being used to grow, to capture new books of business, that kind of thing. Um, and then I know Casey's actually looked at, we fund a lot of finance adjacent companies. So like the pitches and the forks for finance companies. So like accounting companies, that kind of things. Um, but I don't know, Casey, if you wanted to add any additional color to what you've seen. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you hit it on the head there. Um, uh, again, this just goes back. We're, we really are industry agnostic. And, and for the most part, we're just very focused on, on the uh, predictability or the recurring nature of the revenue. So if the finance company, uh, you know, ch is checking those boxes and they can provide the reporting needed, uh, we would certainly uh, be interested. Right. Um, what is minimum corp revenue needed to qualify? Uh, yeah, so, so bare minimum, uh, be five hundred thousand dollars in annual revenue. More typically, would be a million in annual revenue. Can you expand on the list of groups you're focused on? Yeah, yeah, and again, we'll 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 send out this deck so that uh, everybody has, um, I think, has all those. But uh, really, uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, uh, veteran-owned businesses. Uh, LGBTQ plus founders, uh, and then also businesses that are located in um, uh, government mandated low to moderate income areas. Uh, for the most part, we're relying on um, self-reported um, aspects here. Um, well, but there are uh, fantastic uh, certifications that businesses that fall in those categories should uh, can and should uh, you know go go out to get. Are there restrictions to white male owners of a successful corporation? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we are we're focused on helping small businesses across the country. Um, you know, so so uh, there are certainly white males uh, that are business owners and also veterans or serving low to moderate income areas. Uh, so those would qualify for some of the requirements. Um, and, and, but I do, I do want to stress too, we, we also have a carve out for, for any and all us based businesses. Um, so, so if you have somebody that maybe doesn't check one of those boxes or you, or you're not sure, um, you know, if you, it, but they do look like there would be a good fit for our funding model, you know, please, please bring them through and, and, you know, we'd be happy to talk to them. Great. Uh, do you fund in the construction industry? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it's, uh, you know, if, if they're, if they're more on the B2B side, I think it's something we can look at, especially if they're working with, uh, the same types of, um, you know, construction management companies or general contractors again and again, we can see that there's predictability revenue there. Um, specifically thinking about one, uh, we, one of our larger deals was a, uh, electrical contractor. Um, so, so we certainly have looked at uh, construction businesses. Okay. Uh, what are the general rates and fees associated with your programs and what is the general commission paid to brokers? Yeah, so we always like to be transparent that, you know, going back to kind of the capital market spectrum that we laid out, 
we are going to be more expensive than traditional banking and SBA, but we're obviously going to be cheaper than equity and things like merchant cash advances, short-term loans. Um, so I would say in general, we fall in kind of the, and we think about it more as far as a rate of return over say a three to five year period versus an APR. We don't really use traditional interest rates in our lending because of the revenue-based financing aspect of it. But in general, over say three years, we're looking to get anywhere from you know high teens to low twenties back on our um, investment. I would say, and then beyond that, we don't have any hidden fees, so there's no cost for you know getting to a term sheet or you know putting down a deposit for good faith or a lockbox or anything like that. The only additional fees other than just the loan repayment are going to be, you know, pass through legal, which is very standard across most lenders. So just the legal fees that we're incurring in relation to closing the loan, um, we will then pass those through either via a, you know, small upfront origination fee or via a, you know, an invoice on like your third monthly payment. We can get creative in that, but it's really just indicative of the legal costs. And again, it's not hidden. It's very upfront in the term sheet, all of that. Um, and then if you were to choose to add on the expansion advisory support, which is that other side of the business, then that will, of course, carry its own um, additional fee as well. But assuming should you not do the expansion advisory add on, then it's really just the loan repayment and then that one time um, legal pass through cost. And then as far as the relationships with referral partners, our standard agreements are to pay 1% on funded dollars for new fundings. And then half a percent on follow on fundings for those existing relationships. And then we typically, you know, if we get some traction, we get some really good volume sending back and forth. We've closed some deals together. You know, there's no reason that we can't increase that. Um, we have in the past, but we typically start with like 1% new and 0.5% follow ons. Great. Uh, will you find a finance broker who is growing because of the influx of revenue? I think it goes back to what Casey was, was saying around, you know, we're industry agnostic. What really matters more is the data and the financial profile of the business. So if, you know, a company is doing over 500K in revenue and has at least 12 months of revenue history and has multiple clients with contract subscriptions, um, you know, B2B type revenue and their margins are scalable and everything else makes sense, then again, we're not going to discriminate based on specific industry type, the common denominator is really more so those business characteristics. Do you fund the cannabis and C CBD businesses or industry? No. We do not. So we have a couple prohibited industries. Um, one is going to be anything cannabis related, weapons, um, gambling, uh, hard liquor, those kind of things um, are going to be a challenge for us. So all the fun stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, do you do investor funding for business acquisitions? We have. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Casey, maybe you can speak to that because you just did one of these. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say it's our bread and butter, but we can we can get creative. Um, you know, we, we like to look at deals like that. Um, specifically, um, there, we've 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 been part of a uh, an owner financing uh, acquisition uh, where we uh, funded the business being acquired, and then those funds were then uh, you know transferred to the uh, acquirer. Um, I would say it's a very case by case basis, but you know I, I would say if at the at the core, if the if the business um, being acquired or the acquiring entity falls into um, you know the types of businesses that we like to fund. Uh, then it's certainly something we would look at. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, a couple of things there too is, you know, in that situation, we'd essentially be underwriting to two businesses. We'd be underwriting to the acquiring entity and the acquisition target, knowing that that's going to become a consolidated picture that we would be holding our investment. So it just creates a little bit more complexities, not to say that we can't or haven't done it, but that's kind of the difference is we're looking at both who's making the acquisition and who's going to be acquired and basically like, rolling together all of the financial history. So if, you know, one, one target is going to make the acquiring target look a lot worse on paper, then like maybe not something that we can do, but if it's obviously going to strengthen each other and the consolidated entity is going to be, you know, in our, in our target and qualifying based on those metrics, then definitely 
the next piece is just around check sizes. So, you know, because we're, we're capped at 600 K in a single loan and 2 million in total, we basically in a single tranche can only lend up to 600 K and that's not usually a large enough check size to make a single acquisition. And so we're usually more either a piece of a pie or some like diversification of capital as an acquisition is already being carried out so that we can come in, add some growth capital while this new entity is being formed, those kind of things. Um, or we're coming in and like syndicating with some other, other people that are helping with this, but because, you know, not a lot of businesses can be bought for 600 K unless it's like a, a client book or something like that. And so there's just, there's just a lot more um, complexities surrounding that question, but in, in short, it's possible um, if, you know, all those things make sense. Right. Um, in a situation of multiple ownership, do all owners need to be minority to qualify? No. Okay. Uh, can you give us a few examples of some transaction terms, rates, et cetera? Yeah. So, I mean, I can go back to, let's see, I'm going the wrong way. So this is a pretty standard example that Casey walked through of the revenue-based option. So in general, as he said, you know, we're sizing off of revenue. We get to some level of 50K on the low end to 600K on the high end of a single loan. And then that principal amount will have a predetermined and fixed repayment cap that dictates the total amount that's ever going to be repaid by the end of the term. So in this example, again, you know, 1.3 times the principal equates to that obligation of 260K. So now we know that by the end of this three-year term that's laid out here, that 260K is going to be the total amount to ever be repaid by the end of the term. Um, and then every month you're making one payment that's uh, both principal and interest calculated by taking that single digit fixed percent of revenue. So again, in this example, maybe every month that's 4%. And so, you know, in November, we'd be looking back at the total credits or business revenue that went into your bank account in October. We'd say, okay, you made $100,000 this month and we would take 4% of that. And then that 4% total gets allocated to principal and interest on the back end. And then we go into the next month and maybe the next month you only make 50,000 because of the way your seasonality or cash collections are timed. We still take 4% of that lower revenue month and the same thing happens once a month, every month on the same day for three years in this example, up until that 260K total obligation is met. If you hit it early before three years, you're done. Um, if you know you underperform slightly and it looks like you're going to go longer, then you know we would just kind of extend the term, look to refinance. We would obviously be seeing that trend very early on, talking to you, saying, you know, what's going on? Can we help? Um, do we need to restructure? Obviously, if we were to add additional capital throughout that three years, and grow that 200k um, of principal, then we would extend the term and you know refinance all the pieces here. But that's kind of roughly how the revenue-based model is structured. And then the term loan is pretty much everything the same that I just said. The key difference is instead of us modeling what that fixed percent needs to be in order to target hitting that 260k repayment by the end of three years we're just putting in that fixed payment structure. So there's no variability. There's no tied to, being tied to your revenue. Um, every month, you know, you go to bed at night and knowing exactly what's coming out of your account that same day every month. Um, and you get the full amortization schedule up front. And it's just, it's very kind of vanilla flavored bank style in that way. But overall, you know, same effective cost, same similar term length. So still kind of two to five years is our standard range. We like to start around three um, and the key difference is just, do you like the idea of having your payments be variable, um, tied to your revenue, or do you like the idea of just knowing exactly what's coming out of your bank account, um, every month? There's obviously some companies that we feel one or the other works better for, um, depending on the model and, you know, history and all that. But in general, a lot of the time it comes down to, you know, what, what's most attractive to the business as well. Okay. Um, does or has Founders part partnered with any area CDC's community Devo Center? To, is it development centers, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we, 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 we we've got a we've got regional teams across the country uh, who are making inroads with with the uh, CDC specifically, banks, uh, financial service providers. Um, so we we certainly have partnered with with CDCs. Right. 
Um, this is a follow-up question to the one earlier. Um, so I guess he's saying, does this broker's white male own of a successful corporation needs 500K and will move into two to three months, <laughs> six months, um, 500K might be best in a LOC. I'm guessing like, does this sound like it would qualify for you? They're doing Sorry. two to three million um, and they need 500,000, but maybe it would be best as a line of credit. We right. don't offer lines of lines of credit, um, you know, but I think a, a two to three million, um, 500,000 is, is certainly, you know, within our range. Um, it's hard to say without knowing the specifics of the business, but um, I think that was Tom that was asking that. You know, feel free to email us with some some details, and we can we can get you some feedback. Great. Um, and the last question I'm seeing here is: Can brokers charge a processing fee to the clients? Yeah, that's um, so we, we're not gonna, we're not going to add that into our docs you know, um, and we're not going to bake it in our pricing. Um, so if there is a, a relationship that, that you have with your client outside of, of, of our transaction, you, that that's, that's your business. Um, you know, separately we'll pay out the referral fee, um, as Bella, as Bella, Bella spoke to um, on our side. Yeah. So if you're taking a separate fee on, on your end, that's, you know, your business and and you're happy to you're welcome to do whatever you want but as far as our our side we won't we won't bake it in we'll just say you know once the deal's done we were able to do 600k you would get six thousand dollars um wired to you okay. and this was a follow-up on tom's it says i'm in a strong minority market how do i portray an image that i'm not being biased how do i answer that question to the white male. I have some aggressive female minorities. What's the real benefit versus a white male? How do I keep my image clean? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. And honestly, kind of a little bit of the elephant in the room when we're in this space, I think, you know, Casey framed it really well earlier by saying, um, you know, we, we recognize that there is a traditionally underserved market. Our inception as a business was started because our founder and CEO is a double minority and has been a serial entrepreneur and has felt these clear gaps and opportunities to create a platform to, you know, create change and level the playing field. So that's really why we lead with that because, you know, we've lived it, we've seen it. We're all passionate about creating increased access to resources for predominantly underserved demographics, which is why we have a very agnostic definition of what diversity means, because we just know that there's so many people out there that have been underrepresented in the you know venture capital entrepreneurial space. However, that being said, our biggest goal is just to grow small businesses, create more jobs, create more wealth that tangentially, ideally are having a positive impact on these demographics, no matter what. And so we do have a portion of our portfolio and funds that we can invest in fully non-diverse led businesses. We don't really lead with that. And we do have a, a mission um, to be this, you know, uh, status quo breaker kind of, but, you know, we, we won't turn away a business because they don't fit into one of these boxes. We want to overall just help businesses grow, give them the tools to get there. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we frame it is, you know, we lead with this, but that's not to say that we're trying to disqualify or discount the amazing work that somebody that's not diverse could be doing as well. We just are aware and have seen the opportunity to be more mission focused in this space. Um, and that's kind of why we do what we do. I don't know, Casey, if you had anything to, to add. Uh, no, no, well said. You leave it there. Okay. Um, do you have brokerage protection clause where the client has to come through the broker to get more loans with you? So, so we do have a, a referral agreement um, that we use for brokers. Um, and within that agreement, uh, you know, it specific, specifically states that, that any um, future loans will also be paid, um, the, the referral fee. So uh, you know, within our own internal systems, we will mark the broker as essentially connected to to the account. So, um, no, I don't know if there's a specific broker protection clause, but but we, we can guarantee that you know the broker would get paid on on all follow on loans. Okay. 
Right. And so in a way, it's almost like your work's done after the first one, because we'll always have you tied to it in our system. So we have an exact situation that we've done this with, where we've done a second loan for a client that originally came through a broker. The first loan, you know, he made the introduction, the broker did. We went through the whole process. That broker got 1%. And then, you know, months and months later, the company came back, needed a second loan. We deployed that money without the broker was not involved in that second transaction, although you could be, but just in this scenario, um, I now have the relationship directly with the client, not that we tried to cut the broker out. It's just how it happened because they're in our portfolio. They were working with our strategic team as well. So when they needed more money, they just came directly to me. Um, we did it. And then I reached out to the broker and I said, Hey, you know, good news. We just did a follow on for your client and your own, you know, X amount because of that. So it's always going to be something that you're tied to, whether or not you're the one that's having to keep making that intro and facilitate the conversations. If you want to be, we have no problem with keeping you in the mix. Um, but, but we don't have a specific clause around, they have to go through you to get to us especially with those follow-on fundings where they're already going to be dealing directly with our, you know, post-funding servicing team, performance analysis, all of that will be done obviously through founders first. But to Casey's point, we can guarantee that you're, you're always going to get that future commission um, if we were to do additional fundings, regardless of your continued involvement. Uh, real quick too, it looks like we're at the, we got through the last question there. I, I did um, go through a few of your questions um, uh, in the chat too. So uh, please click over and, and, and see um, those answers uh, as well. All right. Thanks, Casey. Well, it looks like we um, have, have, we've answered everything in the Q and A. And like I said, he answered a few to obviously you guys, if anybody has any follow-up questions, um, we'll, I'm sure you'll be happy to answer them offline as well. Um, We've kind of come up on our on our time and I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. So with that, we will uh, wrap things up. I want to say a big thanks to all our participants and especially our valued funding source member and bronze sponsor, Founders First Capital Partners. Thanks for a great job, everyone. And thanks for joining us and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.